In this video, we will discuss Newton's three laws. So Newton's first law, Newton's first law says that in the absence of, in the absence of an external force, if an object is at rest, or is moving with constant velocity, it will continue to do the same. So if you have a block and it's at rest somewhere, okay, so its velocity is zero, if you draw the forces acting on it, you have the normal reaction, you have the, the gravity acting downward, and both and an, and the weight mg are completely balanced, which means there are no external forces acting on it, then this block is really not going to go anywhere. If you have a block that's moving with some constant velocity on a surface, okay, then if there's no external force acting on it, then it'll continue to move with that velocity. Now, in reality, of course, there will always be some friction. So if there is friction, you know, opposing this motion, uh, you of course have the normal reaction and the gravity acting downward, then this friction force over here is going to oppose this motion and is going to bring it to the stops. So in reality, of course, frictionless surfaces are difficult to find, uh, but if there was an ideal frictionless surface and if something was moving on that surface with some velocity, it did not need any external force for it to continue to move. And that's Newton's first law, simply put. Newton's second law, which forms the basis for doing most of the uh, analysis in engineering dynamics and, and kinematics, uh, says that if you have an object modeled either as a particle, and when we say something is a particle, that doesn't mean it's like a minuscule object. It means that something as huge as a space aircraft or an airplane can be modeled as a, as a singular a point where all of its mass is concentrated, okay? And as opposed to a particle assumption, we can have a rigid body assumption where we don't treat something as a particle, we allow for its rotation to happen as well. So it doesn't matter whether you have a particle or an object model as a rigid body, some of the forces acting on it is equal to its mass times the acceleration. If you have a particle, it's the acceleration of that point. If it is a rigid body, it's the acceleration of the center of mass of the rigid body. Now, this is an interesting equation. This, there are certain restrictions before you can use this equation. First is that it can only be used in Newtonian or inertial reference frames. So what are Newtonian or inertial reference frames? So Newtonian inertial reference frames are the frames where the acceleration is zero. There is a restriction on the use of this equation. In this equation, the acceleration can be measured only in certain kinds of frame. They're called Newtonian or inertial reference frames. Newtonian or inertial reference frames are the frames where the acceleration is zero or the velocity is constant. So you can measure the acceleration only with respect to an observer that itself is either at rest or is moving at constant velocity. And that's what this is saying. To understand why it's so important to pick your reference frames carefully, uh, let's look at an example. So this is an example where we have an elevator and inside this elevator, there is a person standing and let's say the friend of that person is also standing. Let's call them A and B and the elevator is going up with some acceleration, okay? So you draw all the forces acting on A. We have Mg and we have the reaction, let's call it M1, okay? Now the, the objective over here is to find out what is the weight experienced by the person A when the elevator is going up with an acceleration A0. Now the, the weight experience is nothing but the reaction felt by his or her feet, okay? That's the R1, which is not necessarily going to be same as, you know, Mg in general, okay? Mg is the true weight of the person A. Now the person B is looking at A and says that, listen, I look at you and you're not going anywhere. So as I am measuring, your acceleration is actually zero. So you apply the Newton's second law, 
sigma f is r1 minus mg and that's along j hat direction so let's say that's y this is x-axis equal to m times now the acceleration as measured by b uh, of a is zero so he says okay that quantity is zero all right so the conclusion is r1 equal to mg now you you know that there is something wrong with this because if the elevator is going up you actually feel a little bit heavier at least in the beginning until the elevator has a constant speed then you know you may not feel much of a difference but at least in the beginning when the elevator starts from zero velocity to some non-zero velocity you do feel heavier okay so clearly there is something wrong with this analysis right what is wrong with this analysis is that the acceleration as measured by b with respect to a was done in a non-newtonian or a non-initial reference frame because the person b is also accelerating upward with the same acceleration as the acceleration of the elevator so the correct way to do this analysis would be to actually measure the acceleration of a with respect to a stationary observer so a stationary observer could be somebody standing here outside the elevator or could be also inside an elevator that is moving with constant velocity so constant v that would be okay too because constant v means the acceleration of this person let's say c would be zero so it has to be the acceleration has to be measured with respect to a stationary observer or an observer moving with constant velocity so how would this analysis change as a result well this diagram is not going to change that's same so what will change is how we write the Newton's second law. So sigma f left hand side is actually still same r1 minus mg j hat equal to m times. Now the acceleration is not zero but a zero j hat because we assume the positive direction to be upward. So that gives us r equal to r1 equal to m times g plus a zero. And that makes sense because you can see over here that the weight is actually going to be more than the true weight which is the mg right the weight experienced by the person is going to be more than the true weight mg so if a0 was equal to 1g then the weight experience would be twice of the, the original weight now how do the things change if let's say the elevator is moving downward well you repeat the same analysis so you have the person a you have the person b now the person b is not important of course because you're doing all measurement with respect to c who is your stationary uh, observer so in this case again sigma f equal to ma let me draw all the forces acting on the person let's say this time direction is r2 the true weight is mg so this would be r2 minus mg j hat equal to m times a0 now the a0 is downward so that will be actually negative j hat so r2 would become m times g minus a0 okay so that's your reaction now you can see that if let's say a0 was equal to g then r2 would be equal to zero this is if a0 is equal to g and that means that you will feel basically no pressure on your feet that's your weightlessness condition so it's very important to keep in mind that the newton's second law uh, has to be applied in a newtonian or initial reference frame which means that when you measure the acceleration when you write this right hand side uh, quantity acceleration it should be measured with respect to a stationary or a constant velocity observer okay now newton's third law says that for every action an action is basically nothing but a force there is a reaction which is equal in magnitude opposite in direction and is collinear so opposite in direction doesn't mean that you could go this way and that way but they have to be really collinear okay along the same line that's what it means so this law is actually very easy to state but it's it's kind of difficult to apply okay and students make a lot of uh, mistakes with that so i'm going to show you a few things so that you don't make those mistakes so, so let's say i have an object a and i have another object b okay and the two objects a and b you know collide against each other in some way so if you draw the forces acting on a and b what would you have well you have a over here so the force f applied by the b on a is that way okay and then the force applied by a on the b would be same in magnitude 
equivalent magnitude, opposite in direction, and collinear, okay, collinear along the same line. And that's what Newton's third law is saying, very simply put. Now, let me ask you another question. So let's say I have a car. And I have a huge truck, okay, a huge truck. And the car and the truck collide against each other. And the question is whether the truck is applying more force on the car or the car is applying more force on the truck or the two are applying the same force on each other okay now if you let your intuition answer this question you might start to think about what happens to the car in the case of a collision with the truck right and you know that the car is probably going to suffer a lot more damage than the truck would suffer so you might be tempted to say that the car is actually exerting less force on the truck than the truck is exerting on, on the car, right? Now, Newton's third law says that actually the force is exerted by the truck on, on the car and the car on the truck would have to be exactly same. So if you draw the forces acting on the car alone, and this is my car, then the force F applied by the truck is F this way, and the force applied on the truck is same force F that the truck applied on the car, right? Now, that's what Newton's third law says. But you think, oh, there's some, there must be something wrong with it because we know that the car experiences uh, more damage as a result of this kind of collision. Well, that's right, but that has nothing to do with the Newton's third law. Now, what happens to the car or what happens to the truck is dependent on many other things. For example, what is the characteristics of the friction between the ground here uh, and the ground uh, between the truck and, and and between the ground and the truck, right? So the, the characteristics of the friction, the weight of the, the object, they also play a role in, in determining as to what happens to the objects after they experience certain force. But the Newton's third law says that the forces have to be same, okay? So that's something you have to keep in mind.